Smallpox, Part 1. The Speckled Monster, The Invisible Fire, The Demon in the Freezer. All of these are titles of books, of which there are many now, about smallpox. Smallpox historically has caused devastating epidemics and pandemics. Millions of people have died and has changed the course of human history. Some of the common names, cottonpox, milkpox, whitepox, the Cuban itch. Smallpox has been known by many different names. The result has always been the same though. Death and destruction and just rabid fear or unnaturally dramatic fear and panic whenever the word is mentioned and the disease has occurred. There's a significantly large historically important library of information about smallpox pathology and epidemiology in modern times. Even though today it's not a naturally occurring disease, there are still re two repositories on earth supposedly, hopefully, that contain the remaining sources of smallpox virus. Hopefully the virus will never escape and we won't have to face the demon in the freezer. But we still have, even today, smallpox vaccine or preventatives and protectives available for those individuals who are at risk to possibly being exposed to the use of smallpox virus as a biological weapon. This is an unfortunate legacy, but it is a distinctly remote possibility. Smallpox virus is also called the variola virus. It's a double-stranded DNA enveloped virus. It is the largest virus that we know of and can just barely be viewed with a visible bright field compound microscope, a typical microscope that we would use to view bacteria because it is such a large virus. By and large, most viruses are so tiny that we require an electron microscope to view their images. These color enhanced drawings or photos on this slide are just those electron micrograph images of variola virus displaying their very distinctive dumbbell shaped internal components which include their genetic double stranded DNA genome. mode of transmission for variola virus is both direct and indirect contact and droplet inhalation. Previous studies have demonstrated that the virus itself can possibly be transported in air for quite a distance. Not many studies have demonstrated this ability, but enough to suggest that this is a fairly hardy or durable virus. Direct contact person to person or indirect contact by fomites have been very well documented for many centuries. In the 20th century, several individuals were responsible for the eradication of smallpox on the earth. D.A. Henderson is one of those individuals. Click on the link and hear him describe a typical case of smallpox. Many individuals who worked with Dr. Henderson, including Donald Hopkins, have described smallpox as being one of the worst diseases ever viewed or ever experienced by humans. The typical smallpox infection was a very serious disease and very fearful disease. The individual would develop a very high fever, 
feel terrible, aching pains, abdomen, back, what have you, go to bed. And after two days, these little pimples would appear in the face and they'd grow into pustules and would be all over the body with these pustules. And they would be in the inside of the mouth and over the tongue. But the individual had trouble eating, had trouble drinking. He uh, felt miserable throughout this period. And it would extend over about two to three weeks before the uh, pustule was, uh, would form scabs and they'd fall off. So throughout history, this has been a disease that's been recognized and people have uh, worshipped smallpox deities in a number of different countries. It is the only disease for which there are deities in different countries. It was so important to so many people. There are two types of smallpox, variola major or variola minor, also called alastrum, that are recognized historically. There are a few other variants, but by and large variola major has anywhere from a 30 to a 50 percent mortality rate. Variola minor is a much lower mortality rate depending on the individual. And oftentimes, if we look at human history, it's suggested that when human beings started to domesticate animals and to settle down into towns and villages and farms, that we started to see the occurrence of smallpox suggested that smallpox as a disease probably started to appear anywhere from eight to 10,000 years ago in the agricultural settlements in northeastern Africa. From there, through trade routes, the disease spread through Egypt and then to India. Those are some of the countries with the oldest examples that we've been able to find of smallpox. with smallpox is that the incubation phase is fairly lengthy. So a person might be exposed and yet not show any kind of sign or symptom for almost two or three weeks. The incubation phase can any, be anywhere from 7 to 17 days. Remember, in the incubation phase, the microorganism is establishing the infection, but you don't have any noticeable outward change in signs or symptoms. In the prodromal phase, after the incubation phase, the patients now start to feel some kind of discomfort. These are usually flu-like symptoms. They're so vague, it's very difficult in some cases for physicians to really pinpoint what's wrong with the patient. Unless, of course, they have extensive experience with smallpox cases. One of the notable symptoms that would often distinguish a patient with smallpox versus any other kind of pox-like disease is a severe backache or back pain. It's at this time, during the prodromal phase, that the pathogen is now moving from cells in our bodies to transmission through blood and other body fluids to spread throughout the whole entire body. So patients start to feel really uncomfortable, but the worst is yet to come. Now we're entering into the symptomatic phase. The early stages of the symptomatic phase show a fine rash that's often called a macule. This is a flat, red discoloration on the skin. There's no elevation, but it is going to be the beginning of what will eventually be a pox or a pustule. It's going to take a couple of days for this to change from this flat macule, little reddish image, to the traditional pustule that we associate with smallpox. Within a day or so of the macule forming, we will now start to see that the macule changes into a papule, which means that there's some substance to the structure. If you run your finger over 
the papule. It's a small, solid, elevated lesion. Remember, solid is the key to distinguishing a papule from the other structures that are about to change on this patient's skin. After another day or two, the papule starts to fill with a clear liquid. We now call these structures vesicles. A vesicle has a small blister-like appearance. Again, the liquid is clear and forms after a papule has appeared on the skin. Another day or so after the vesicles have formed, the material inside this blister-like structure changes from clear to a thick grayish-yellow material that we call pus. These pus-filled structures are called pustules. And with smallpox, these pustules form both on the skin, on mucous membranes, and virtually everywhere inside and outside the body. The changes in the damage that we see on the outside also occurring on the inside. At this point, this is essentially the peak of the symptomatic phase and can last for several days. The pussy material in the pustules contains millions of viruses. Each one, if ruptured, can expose a person to highly infectious smallpox virus. These pustules continue to fill and get larger and larger. Sometimes the center of the pustule essentially begins to collapse as the pustule essentially, much like filling a balloon full of water, gets to the point where it has extended or expanded the skin to the point of breaking or rupturing. Pustules exceed the capacity for the skin to hold the volume of the pussy material. Eventually, these pustules rupture. Everything that comes in contact with the leaking material out of the pustules essentially is loaded with virus and can be used to transfer virus from person to person. This would be essentially how we can have direct or indirect contact transmission mode of transmission. Notice that all of these photos that we've used to illustrate the formation of the pustules and these clear symptoms of smallpox are patients with variola major. Patients with variola minor have much fewer or many fewer pustules. They still have the same kind of appearance. They're just much fewer in number. And the other symptoms that accompany fever, pain, ache with variola minor are again much less severe than patients with variola major. Once the pustules have ruptured, just like any other wound, a scab forms over the wound. It's these crusty scabs that are going to have an important role to play historically in the development of material that could be used to essentially prevent people from contracting smallpox. Once these scabs dry up and fall off, then we see the physical damage that remains on the skin of patients who've had smallpox. And of course, the very distinctive pox or pockmarked skin that's always historically been associated with survivors.